Welcome, everybody, to the Ben Collin Memorial Lecture. It's brilliant to see everybody here. My name is Kate Jones, and I work in the Centre for Biodiversity and Environment Research. So the Ben Collin Memorial Lecture is an annual event that we host at CBER in memory of an amazing person, Ben Collin, who was an amazing and wonderful uh, mentor, friend, and, uh, and teacher. And uh, we want to celebrate his wonderful life and his amazing achievements, whose work inspires us all, uh, you know, has and will, uh, and, and will do in the future, keep inspiring our, our work in biodiversity and conservation. So it's really brilliant to see uh, Alana and, and the rest of Ben's family here, and it's really brilliant that you've come, and it's, it makes it a really a special event when you guys are here. So thank you very much for coming. Um, so I would like to um, introduce our speaker. So um, our, our speaker this year is Professor Jones, <laughs> Professor Julia Jones, uh, who's a professor in conservation science at Bangor University. Um, so her work over the last 20 years has really established her as a leading conservation scientist in the world. And she was honored in, uh, in 2012 by the British Ecological Society, Society for her outstanding work in ecology with the Founder of Prize. So just trying to summarize Julia's work, I guess um, it's the intersection of people and nature, which is really close to uh, a, lot of, a lot of our hearts. So it's this conservation approaches that, that need to work for both people and for nature. And this social dimension really uh, it threads through all of her work that she does. So Julia's research has, has taken her to a huge number of countries, in particular uh, Madagascar, and I think you've just come back from there today. Last night. Last, <laughs> last night. Um, so, in, these, in this area, conservation issues and um, social issues are particularly acute and intertwined. So, it's a really interesting area in which to work on. And Julia often works with local collaborators and uh, communities. Um, and her research has been instrumental in developing conservation approaches not just work for conserving biodiversity, but alleviating poverty and helping inequality. So it's really difficult to overstate Julia's work, and I'm, I'm absolutely, and we all are, really delighted that you could come and give the talk today. So please come to the stage. Thank you, Kate. That was an amazing introduction, and I'm now feeling like all I can do is let you down. So couldn't you have just lowered expectations? But thank you. Um, no, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. So from very early in Ben's career, he recognized that um, really if we're going to do anything about biodiversity loss, we need robust uh, indicators of what's happening to biodiversity over time. And of course, he was instrumental in putting both the, uh, the Living Planet Index and the Sampled Red List Index on kind of robust scientific footing. Um, but as, as his career developed, he started to ask the next set of questions using these indicators to say, is what we're working, what is what we're doing to address biodiversity loss working? And that is exactly the focus of, of today's talk. So as Kate said, I've worked in Madagascar for, for the last 20 years. And consistently, Madagascar is in the top 10 recipient countries of biodiversity-related aid. Um, and a huge amount, millions and millions, has been spent on conservation programs in Madagascar over the last few decades. And legitimately, we, we want answers to questions such as, does ecotourism improve livelihoods? Do conservation education programs reduce the amount of lemur hunting? Does community forest management slow deforestation? These are all impact evaluation questions where we need to evaluate the impact of an intervention, such as an ecotourism scheme, on an outcome, local livelihoods. Now, from when you were in primary school or certainly high school, you'd have learned about the idea of experimentation, that if you want to know the impact of something on something else, the best way to go about it is to take your units, randomly allocate them to receive that intervention, whatever it might be, uh, or not, to be the control, and then you look at the outcomes. <laughs> 
And um, medical science started really quite early in thinking about this kind of approach to understanding the impacts of something on something else. Um, with the first medical trials being carried out in the 18th century um, by this guy, James Lind, who was tackling the really terrible problem of, um, of scurvy. Now, some um, sort of sea missions back in the 18th century, um, you know, really high proportions, over 50% of sailors would die of this horrible, horrible disease. And James Lind took the, took the initiative and actually tested the various different theories that were out there as to which, um, which interventions would have... Um, a, an impact to reduce scurvy, and he randomly allocated sailors to receive different potential treatments. Now, obviously, those that received citrus fruit were somewhat more lucky than those that received um, salt water. And um, although medical science was slow on the uptake, I mean, it took 40 years before the Admiralty started to recommend um, citrus fruits to sailors on voyages, and another 100 years before systematic medical trials became normal practice. You know, eventually, um, these kind of randomized control trials did become the absolute mainstay of modern medical science. But um, for a long time, they only tended to be used in those kind of laboratory settings, such as carried out by medics. Um, but over the last two decades, there's been a revolution, particularly in development economics um, and also in public policy more broadly around education, in the idea of using these kind of randomized control trials to ask questions about what works and what doesn't work. And last year, these three, Esther de Flo, Michael Kramer and, and Banerjee, uh, won the Nobel Prize for their experimental approach to poverty alleviation. So the kind of work, I mean, they particularly were famous for popularizing the use of randomized control trials to investigate the effectiveness of an intervention aimed at poverty reduction in the kind of messy socioeconomic social real realities um, of the real world. So the kind of experiment they're famous for, a really classic one, was looking at the impact of deworming school children. It's a very cheap intervention, giving children deworming tablets on their their health and their educational outcomes. And the, the effect size of this, of this intervention, which is a very cheap intervention, was shown to be huge. And this has directly led to the Deworm the World initiative, which in 2017 alone led to the, um, the treatment of 275 million school children. So you'd think these guys are heroes to everyone. You'd think, what's not to like about this? But interestingly, the randomisters, as they've become known, have faced a lot of kind of a lot of criticism. Um, from, um, from people who feel that a lot of these issues really shouldn't be subject to experiments. So I'll illustrate this with, with a, um, a, a very influential set of experiments from the early 60s in early, early years intervention for, for disadvantaged children in the US. And what was found there was that using an RCT... Um, that there was a huge benefit of early intervention, investment in early years education, in long-term outcomes, in including eventually tax revenue from those children that were invested in early. Um, but some feel that this kind of experimentation is immoral because how can you roll a dice to decide who gets and who doesn't get what is clearly going to have some positive intervention? We'll come back to this question of ethics later, but this is one of the key criticisms of randomized control trials um, in, in public policy. So let's come to conservation because, of course, that's what we're here to talk about. So what about experiments in conservation? Now, of course, um, kind of... Applied ecology, you know, experiments at some level have been a mainstay of applied ecology for forever, for decades, since Fisher, um, who I think was from this department. And if you, you search on the conservation evidence database, which of course you should all do if you want to find out the best available evidence for a specific intervention in conservation, you'll find a lot of these kind of applied ecology experiments that give us information about how a certain intervention impacts some outcomes. And conservation scientists also engage in these much larger scale experiments. So, of course, the biological dynamics of forest fragments experiment will be familiar to a lot of you. And I think actually the last Ben Coden lecture was given by Ben Ewers, who started the SAFE project. Again, a large scale experiment looking at the impacts of deforestation on ecological outcomes and biodiversity outcomes. But what we don't do much of in conservation is the sort of the sort of large-scale experiments in the kind of messy social and ecological world in which conservation operates, where we're looking at the impact of an intervention that might be an incentive program, for example. 
and what that means in terms of ultimate outcomes. Back in the year 2000, the Bolivian NGO, Natura Bolivia, were starting to roll out their, their intervention that had become known as Watershared, which is a type of payment for ecosystem services scheme in a new area. And um, this scheme aims to slow deforestation, improve biodiversity, and, um, and improve water quality for local communities. Um, and they decided to find out if this intervention is working or not by running a randomized control trial at scale. And this is so unusual in conservation. So I'm going to give it quite a lot of attention today, and we're going to focus the rest of the talk around this trial. And I'm going to start by just introducing the trial and telling us, showing what it tells us about the effectiveness of this specific scheme. And I'm then going to use this, um, this randomized control trial of the watershed intervention to kind of rebut, at least partly, some of the key objections to the use of randomized control trials. And then in the last part of the talk, I'm going to sort of give my own very personal top tips for how to improve um, conservation impact evaluation uh, more broadly. So, of course, as with any work, uh, this is absolutely not my own. Um, um, it's particularly the lead authors of the key papers, Edwin Pienegar and Emma Vick. Um, and, of course, we have many other co-authors and collaborators in our uh, partner organization, Natura Bolivia. So... Watershed, essentially how it works, is farmers in the Bolivian Andes um, and surrounding areas are offered, um, are offered the opportunity to enroll parcels of their land in what's known as watershed agreements. And in exchange for promising not to deforest and not to allow cattle uh, into the rip riparian forest patches that are in their land, they are... Um, promised development assistance such as irrigation tubing, uh, barbed wire, fruit trees, bee boxes, etc. And this is paid for, at least partly, by um, a tax on downstream water users' water bills. So you won't be able to read this, but essentially this is a, 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 a bill, and you can see that the, the payment for ecosystem services is a, is a tax on the water bill. It's a payment on the water bill. And the aim of the scheme, I mean, Natura Bolivia are a conservation NGO. They're interested in the biodiversity of these incredible forests. So at least partly, uh, the aim is to, um, uh, to improve forest condition and slow deforestation for the sake of biodiversity. But part of the sort of rationale and rhetoric around the scheme has always been focused on um, the idea of these forests as being some kind of a water tower for local communities, and that by conserving the forests and keeping the cattle out of the water, out of the forests, particularly the forests close to rivers and streams, that will improve the quality of water consumed downstream. So what they did was back in 2010, um, there was 128 communities in a new area they wanted to operate in, and they carried out, I've got four shown here, so imagine those four are 128, and they carried out baseline data collection, both looking at the quality of the water, looking at E. coli contamination of water, and really, really, they carried out a very detailed socioeconomic survey looking at livelihoods, um, uh, uh, where they get their water from, incidents of diarrheal disease, this kind of thing. And then in... Uh, then they, using stratified random sampling, they selected the treatment communities, which were then offered the opportunity to enroll their land in, in watershed agreements or control communities that weren't offered the opportunity. And then in 2015, by which time my team had become involved, so we ran the end line data collection, and we repeated the, um, the data collection of the E. coli contamination and also of the socioeconomic survey. And then the intervention was rolled out in control communities. That had been part of the agreement for randomization was that rollout eventually would happen uh, in control communities as well. And I'm going to present data from two different analyses, one looking at deforestation. So this is using publicly available um, global forest change data, but we validated it for, for use in that part of Bolivia. Um, and we essentially look at, we compare deforestation rates um, um, between control and treatment communities. And then we also carried out this water quality analysis where we measured E. coli contamination both at the intake into the gravity-fed water systems that are in the forest and at the main ta village tap site um, in control and treatment communities at baseline and end line. And um, you know how we all hate Reviewer 2, right? Well, I just want to say here, Reviewer 2 was definitely on our side. Um, 
this research must have been a monumental undertaking. It was clear that one of the other reviewers had no idea how difficult <laughs> and enormous this water quality monitoring must have been. He's so right, or she's so right. They are so right. And so huge credit to Edwin, who, trying to collect these water samples, you have to keep them on ice for at least, and plate them out within two hours and then keep them incubated for 24 hours. This was an absolute logistical nightmare um, uh, and a huge amount of field work. So what did our results show? Well, um, yes. Did, was there an impact on deforestation? No. No impact at all if you just compare deforestation outcomes between control and treatment communities, there's definitely no impact. But, and it is important when you're thinking about impact evaluation to distinguish between effectiveness, so that's the effectiveness of the intervention under real world conditions, and efficacy. So what's the impact under ideal conditions? So let's imagine your head of department in UCL was concerned about bad backs, and people have bad backs, and so he decided everyone should plank for an hour at lunchtime every day. So everyone was going to come into a public space and plank every day for an hour. Now, the efficacy of that intervention would be quite high because we'd all have abs of steel and back pain would reduce. It would, be really, it would have high efficacy. But the effectiveness would be low because I'm sure many of you would find somewhere else to be at lunchtime. And that's the case with any intervention. It's the same with a diet, same with a drug. You have to consider both the effectiveness of that drug or that treatment program, that diet, in the real world, how people actually interact with it and whether they, they, they engage or not. And, you, and that's a separate question. That effectiveness question is a slightly separate question from whether or not if people took the diet as instructed or followed the medicine as instructed, um, they would see benefits. And so we have done a secondary analysis, which is quite complex and I won't talk about in detail, but essentially it does suggest some evidence of efficacy. So there does seem to be a small reduction in deforestation where a large proportion of land was enrolled in watershed. Because, of course, this is a voluntary intervention and there is huge variation across the treatment communities in the proportion of land enrolled um, in the intervention. So the effectiveness of the intervention... Zero in the real world, but some evidence, but very weak, that, that there was at least some, um, there could have at least been some efficacy of the intervention. And what about water quality? Unfortunately, it's just as bad a story. There was no effect of being in a treatment community on E. coli con contamination of drinking water. So to summarise, over the first five years of the watershed intervention, um, there was negligible impact on deforestation and no impact on water quality. But I want to use this, this experience of this really unusual and sort of brave and unique kind of effort by a small Bolivian conservation organization to run a randomized controlled trial to look properly at the effectiveness of their intervention. I want to use this to kind of explore and debunk, at least partly, um, some of the main criticisms that have been thrown at the use of randomized control trials. So firstly, this idea that ICTs are unethical. Now, in the world of medical trials, the principle of equipoise is used. So it's only considered ethical to trial a new drug treatment or a new whatever it is treatment if there's genuine uncertainty between whether the new um, treatment is better or worse or not than the existing best treatment. So it's always comparing this new treatment against the current best practice. And you need to demonstrate, to, you know, to get any kind of approval for, for a clinical trial, you need to demonstrate this idea of clinical equipoise. But there's another... Um, but in the, in the context of using, um, of developing interventions that clearly are going to have a benefit, so such as this intensive early years education program I mentioned earlier, you know, it's very hard to justify that ignoring these children is going to be just as good as giving them intensive early years education. You know, that's, that's probably not realistic. Um, but the ethical foundation that's used to justify um, randomized control trials in those situations is the fact that the resources are very seldom available to roll out such interventions to everyone anyway. Not everybody is going to be reached by this kind of early years intervention. So why not, therefore, randomize who is reached and who isn't to therefore collect really decent, high-quality evidence on um, the effectiveness of the intervention, on the effect size, that could then be used to bring more resources in? And I think that's really the... Um, the argument that you would use for in the case of the watershed RCT. So 
Nacho Bolivia didn't, couldn't possibly roll out across the whole of this landscape when they started working there, the 128 communities. They simply didn't have the resource. Now, it would have been easier for them to do what most NGOs do and just work in a portion of the landscape. It was a very sort of brave and innovative, I think, idea to say, no, we are going to randomize where we work and work with scientists to, to sort of evaluate the impact. But I think that's the, that's the justification um, uh, for, for this being ethical. Another big criticism uh, against RCTs is that they're not practical. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, who, you would never dream of running a randomized controlled trial to look at the effectiveness of protected areas on biodiversity outcomes, for example. That would make no sense. There's a whole discipline, and many of you I know are involved in working in it, around conservation planning to work out where best to put conservation areas. It would make no sense at all and would be impossible politically to randomize that in a landscape. It would make no sense. So, of course, RCTs are absolutely not suitable in all situations. Um, so I don't think that really needs, needs laboring. I think, I think the, the reason why, one of the reasons why RCTs have become so controversial is because in some disciplines, particularly in, in development economics and public policy education, et cetera, um, it's become almost a kind of, if you're not doing an RCT, you're not doing a proper evaluation. And I think a lot of the kind of backlash against RCTs, saying, well, it's not always ethical, and it's not always practical, is partly a kind of resistance against this kind of almost religious fervor that RCTs are the only sort of evaluation, which I just don't think is helpful. And I think us in conservation science can hopefully completely avoid such kind of polarizing debates. Now, another challenge with RCTs, coming back to this point I touched upon earlier with this idea of efficacy and effectiveness, is this, question, this point that you kind of assume that you can achieve perfect treatment assignments. So it kind of assumes that you can say, these people are in the treatment group and these people are in the control group. And the truth is that really isn't always the case. And in our watershed RCT, it was far from a clean experiment um, and it was really quite messy. So for example, if you look at this plot here, which the x-axis is the percentage uptake of land in the community that was enrolled in these watershed agreements, and the y-axis is the number of communities. And you can see, as you'd expect, that for control communities, by far the majority of communities had zero of their land in the, in the scheme. That makes sense. They're controlled communities. They shouldn't, have, they shouldn't have the scheme. But one community, 20% of their land was enrolled in watershed agreements. And that's because the real world is complicated. And you turn up in a treatment community and you offer to enroll people's land. And the technician is then taken off to kind of GPS the land. But it turns out the land is the other side of a hill and it's actually in a control community and it's because they've inherited land from their granny or whatever it is. So the real world is messy. And similarly, although we'd like to have seen a nice kind of normal distribution kind of up at this end of the, of the percentage of land uptake that was in treat, you know, treatment communities, we'd like to have seen a nice sort of red normal distribution up here. Actually, in reality, the, high, the largest proportion of... Um, um, the most common proportion of land uh, enrolled in watershed communities and treatment communities, sorry, enrolled in watershed agreements and treatment communities was actually zero. So, you know, there was a lot of communities out there which were in our treatment group and were offered the watershed agreement and no one took up any watershed agreement. So no land was enrolled. And so this kind of messiness and imperfect treatment assignment um, is a problem in randomized controlled trials. I mean, you can deal with it statistically and We've written papers about it, but um, it's, it's, not, it's not simple. Now, another really common criticism of RCTs is that they're reductionist and they tell you nothing about mechanisms, nothing useful about how the intervention is or isn't working. It just tells you simply it's not working or it is working, and this is the effect size. And so many people will criticize RCTs as not being particularly useful outside of the specific context where they were carried out. Um, but... I'd argue that's not necessarily the case. And in a paper that we've just had accepted in conservation biology, we show how by using the intervention's underlying theory of change and by really critically evaluating each of the kind of each of the potential intermediate outcomes in that theory of change using the RCT, we can say a lot about what is working and what isn't working in the intervention rather than just focusing on those outcomes of deforestation and water quality. So all, in, all good conservation interventions, of course, should have a theory of change. Sometimes it's called a log frame or um, a results chain. But essentially what it does is it links the activities that you're doing 
to intermediate and then ultimate outcomes based on a number of assumptions. So, for example, in the watershed intervention, barbed wire was made available to, to the households, and the idea was that this would make it possible for people to manage grazing, to keep cattle out of the forest and, and um, improve great input and keep them on improved land. And so the idea was that this would result in increased areas of improved grazing and that ultimately this would contribute to reduced forest clearance and degradation. So this is one of the pathways by which impact is supposed to occur. And so what we did in this recent paper is we looked at all 16 of these intermediate um, outcomes and indicators of ultimate outcomes, all based on this large social survey that was done at baseline and endline in control and intervention, to look at what did change and what didn't change. So those that didn't change are shown in yellow. Those that did change in the direction we hypothesized are shown in red, uh, sorry, a green. And those that are significant but against hypothesis are shown in red. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. But the point I want you to take from this is simply that this has allowed us, I'm not going to talk through it in detail now, but it's allowed us to go, okay, so we know that after five years there was no change in deforestation, there was no change in water quality. But, for example, the number of fruit trees on farms did increase, but the market value of fruit produced didn't. These kind of things that can allow us to really tease apart the sort of mechanism by which the intervention did or didn't, in this case, have, a, have an impact on ultimate outcomes. And the final criticism, very common criticism of RCTs, is that there's more to impact evaluation than RCTs. This is the point I mentioned earlier. You know, there's been a kind of, a sort of, almost like a religious fervor behind the idea that, you know, all good impact evaluation should be proper randomized control trials. And I think this is a great example from the watershed RCT that illustrates why that absolutely is not the case. So if you remember, one of the objectives of the watershed project, the watershed intervention, was to keep cattle out of the river um, at, at riparian forest to therefore improve downstream water quality. Now that depends upon people like Don Jesus here keeping cattle out of the key points in the forest in the, where there's a water intake, where water is coming from the stream or a spring into the gravity fed systems that feed down ultimately into the village. So what you'd expect if the intervention was working is that in control, there'd be more water intakes protected from cattle in treatment communities than in uh, control communities. But this isn't what we observed at all. And of course, that's because there's many reasons people might choose to protect this critical, critical area where the water is taken from the forest into their gravity-fed system that are not connected to this specific conservation intervention. And equally, a large proportion of the land that was enrolled in watershed agreements wasn't anywhere near a water intake. The vast majority of the land might have even been on rivers, on streams, that didn't feed anywhere into water systems that actually ultimately impact communities. So there's no mechanism by which that land enrolled can affect the water quality downstream. It just, there's just no mechanism for that to happen. And when we looked, comparing water, the control and treatment water intakes, and we found no difference, we realized, you know, we didn't need this RCT at all. A very simple qualitative-based evaluation, based entirely a theory-based evaluation, it's often called, based on the theory of change, simply going, okay, what's the mechanism by which this intervention could impact water quality? Well, it has to be protection of these key water sites uh, in the forest. Let's look at whether or not there's a difference. Oh, there isn't. There's no mechanism for an impact. You didn't need this huge five-year-long measuring water quality and control and treatment communities to know there was no mechanism for this to have an impact. Um, so I think the real take home from that is you absolutely do not always need um, a randomized control trial. So coming back to these kind of standard objections that you, you often see to the use of RCTs, first is that RCTs are unethical. And I'll say I really, I really do feel that that's not necessarily true. They can be unethical. But as long as there's genuine uncertainty, as long as either there's genuine uncertainty as to which, whether the treatment or the control option are better, then it's fine. Or if it's obvious that the treatment is going to bring some kind of a benefit, as long as genuinely there's insufficient resources to roll out at scale and you are using the randomization to um, not to limit who gets it, because there's already going to be a limit to who gets it, but to learn as much as possible, then I would argue there's no problem with ethics. <coughs> 
Secondly, the criticism is that RCTs are not always practical. Absolutely true. I don't think that's controversial in the slightest. RCTs assume you can allocate people to control and treatment perfectly. Yes, this is true, but it can be, can be dealt with. Um, there's a whole literature uh, in, development, in, in, in economics in general, really, around this question, and it's, it's really well, well developed. Um, RCTs don't tell us anything about mechanisms. I really don't think that's true. I think, I mean, the editor of Conservation Biology who accepted our paper is sat in the audience, but I would say, and he's accepted it now, but I would say, genuinely, I think this paper really shows that that is a bit simplistic, and you can use, as long as you're combining the idea of a kind of theory-based approach to impact evaluation, which depends so strongly on this theory of change or log frame, and you combine that with the kind of robust analysis of these intermediate outcomes, comparing your control and treatment, then I think actually the RCT can add a huge amount to understanding um, mechanisms. And finally, there's more to evaluation than RCTs, and I cannot agree more. I'm certainly not some kind of advocate that every kind of intervention in conservation should be a randomized control trial. Absolutely not. So for the final part of my talk, um, I'm going to give my kind of very personal perspective on um, how we could improve conservation impact evaluation um, more broadly. And the first point is, and it ties back to that last, the last point I just made, which is that RCTs are not always appropriate, and that's that we need to get much better at quasi-experimental approaches. So I'm working with two PhD students at the moment who are asking really important um, impact evaluation questions. So Hannah is looking at what's the impact of protected areas on global water bird populations. And she's got this incredible data set of 13,000 sites where water birds have been counted for at least 40 years. And she's using this to look at what the impact is of protected areas on water birds. Um, and of course, this, is, this couldn't possibly be answered with an experiment, but she's making absolute best use of quasi-experimental approaches, which use statistics to construct a counterfactual, what, what, has hap what would have happened in the absence of the intervention. And I'm also working with Alejandro Guza, who's looking at the impact of Red Plus on deforestation, again, using a, a, a near-global uh, data set. Now, I was going to um, give some, go into some detail about some interesting little facts about uh, things I found out about matching and quasi-experiments recently, but I decided instead just to do a plug for another of our papers that um, uh, was led by Judith Schleicher that came out also in conservation biology late last year, which is about the use particularly of statistical matching for conservation science in impact evaluation, but it also has a bit of a summary and an introduction to different quasi-experimental approaches um, that can be used and have been used. But what I want to spend more time focusing on is the importance of pre-registration. Um, so pre-registration is the idea that when you do a study, you, public, you make publicly available your methods before you carry out your analysis. And the most extreme version um, is, is publishing as a registered report, which is where peer review is conducted simply on your introduction to judge whether or not the framing is interesting and makes an interesting contribution to the literature and the methods. So that's, that's known as a registered report. And the idea of these approaches is that you commit yourself publicly in advance to your methods, and that can then sort of tie your hands. It's a bit like Odysseus when he was on the way back from the Battle of Troy, and he had heard the rumor of the, the sirens that had this beautiful song, but sailors would like run off ship to their death because they wanted to get close to the sirens. And so he tied his arms, or he got his sailors, who had beeswax in their ears, so they couldn't hear the siren song, of course, um, he got his sailors to tie his arms so that um, uh, he could, you know, he was tied in advance. So he'd committed in advance that he couldn't go to the, to, the, to the sirens. And he'd asked his sailors, you know, however much I plead, just row harder and tie me tighter. And that way he was able to resist the temptation of the siren's song. And I think that's what pre-registration is all about. So this study that we've just published, um, looking at the mechanisms of the, how the RCT, sorry, how the watershed intervention has or hasn't had impact. That paper that's, that's recently accepted in conservation biology, we submitted that as a registered report. So I think it's going to be the first registered report in conservation biology. And so it was peer-reviewed entirely based on the introduction 
and on the methods. Um, and the reason I think this is important is because this analysis is super complicated. We've got 16 potential outcomes, remember. We have two modeling approaches, one looking at the, um, the efficacy, so the effectiveness in the real world as implemented, one trying to tease out efficacy based on those that uptake the intervention. So it's a really complex analysis, really open to cherry picking and what's called harking, hypothesizing after results are known, which is where you tell the nice story of what your data shows after you've already done the analysis. And I think we all know that's far too common in science. And I genuinely think that if this paper, if we hadn't submitted it as a registered report, I bet we would have been essentially forced to cherry pick and to hark to tell an interesting story. Because the real story is quite complex. You know, we have some changes, some, some insignificant outcomes, some changing with hypotheses, some changing against our hypotheses. It's all a bit messy. And I think we all know that the real world doesn't like, or the scientific world doesn't like messy realities. Now, this bit's a bit controversial. Um, and I don't want to be criticizing the authors or the editors for a decision, but I think it is worth airing. So since I've become interested in pre-registration and... Um, um, and sort of these kind of the importance of, of pre-registration um, and pre-analysis plans. I've started seeing everywhere incidents where I think, mm, oh, I'm sure the results would have been different if they'd pre-registered that. So last year, two papers came out a month apart on the relationship between deforestation and malaria. So the first, um, published in um, uh, World Development, finds no significant result. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lovely data set, 17 African countries, really large data set, looking at the relationship between deforestation and malaria. And it was rejected many times. I asked the authors, I approached the authors and said, where did you submit it? And they said, oh, The Lancet, PNAS, Science Advances, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually it found its home in, in world development. The other paper, um, which um, looks at the relationship between deforestation and malaria in just three provinces or areas of Brazil, that finds a significant relationship, and that was published in PNES. Now, which one do you think had a pre-analysis plan? So, yes, you're right. The world development one, and this is how I was aware of the study, and in fact, a talk about this paper three years ago is what first got me interested in the idea of pre-analysis plans. And that's how I knew about this study and had been kind of following its progress. Um, it had a pre-analysis plan, uh, it, so they were absolutely tied to the mast with their analysis, and they found no, no significant effect. Now, the second paper is a really interesting paper. I'm not in any way criticizing it. It's a really interesting paper. But I can't help thinking that the quite complex relationship they find between, it involves feedbacks between both deforestation, sorry, malaria, sorry, deforestation increasing malaria and malaria increasing deforestation. I can't help think that that complex model wasn't prioritized a prior wasn't hypothesized a priori now that doesn't mean it's not valuable to publish it's really important to do kind of exploratory analysis of data to, to give us hypothesis about how the world works but I think we're not good enough in science at doing two things one valuing null results that come from robust analysis that's been publicly pre-registering we really should be celebrating those not you know rejecting them from every journal they're submitted to until eventually they find their home and secondly Articles like this should be more explicit up front about what was hypothesized a priori and what is a kind of emergent property of the data as they've, as they've explored the data. Those kind of um, uh, papers are still valuable, but I think we need to be a little bit more explicit. And the final point I want to make is that we need for a better conservation impact evaluation, we need much better collaboration between practitioners and scientists. So, of course, in this case, where they set it up as a randomized control trial, Natura Bolivia couldn't possibly have done this, you know, without scientists, and scientists couldn't possibly have done it without Natura. You know, they had their funding for um, setting up the intervention in a new area, and then they in collaboration with some scientists, applied for research funding to allow them to do the whole baseline in extra sites and randomize and all of that. And then I applied for research funding to do the end line. And I think it is really interesting that it was this small Bolivian NGO that took the, took the risk and took the kind of 
the brave step of doing something so unusual and opening themselves to such scrutiny as doing this kind of really robust evaluation of their intervention. You know, it's not the big NGOs, WF, WCS, CI, that are doing these kind of experiments. I think it's so interesting that it was this small Bolivian NGO that did this. And I think they deserve huge credit. It's been a real sadness to me that they have faced criticism. Some of their funders have said, hey, this paper's come out saying that your intervention doesn't slow deforestation. But the reality is, by the time that paper was published, that was three years after they'd seen the results, um, started to see the results, they'd hired my PhD student straight after his PhD, and he's been in Bolivia now for two years, helping them redesign their intervention. So this NGO deserves absolute credit for having exposed themselves to that kind of scrutiny, um, which I think you know, in this more difficult times where everyone's competing for funding, I think many conservation organizations wouldn't be that willing. Um, and so we really need to celebrate NGOs that are willing to go through or conservation organizations that are willing to expose themselves to such, um, such scrutiny. And so finally, coming back to, to Ben's work, so the Living Planet Index, which, um, of course, Ben did so much to put on a, on a firm scientific footing, um, to, uh, last year, was it, the Living Planet came, came out last time, and it showed that monitored vertebrate species have declined by 60% since 1970. I mean, that is a shocking, shocking, shocking statistic. Um, and we just can't keep doing more of the same. You know, George Santayana, the philosopher, famously said, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I think conservation as a discipline needs to get much, much better at learning from the past, learning what works and what doesn't, exposing itself to, you know, exposing ourselves to failure, to scrutiny, um, and really um, working out what works in conservation and what doesn't. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Julia. That was a fantastic talk, and uh, raising our, asking us to raise our game slightly in our, in our understanding of how we carry out research, I think is a really important point. So I'd, I'd like to um, open the floor up to any questions that anyone might have. Yes? Do you want the microphone? Yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for that. Hey, um, really nice talk. So, have you looked into... Um, <coughs> so, a lot of the control areas didn't protect any land, was that how it was? Have you looked into subsetting and looking at the actual areas that protected land, control areas? You're talking about quasi-experimental stuff. So, so subsetting some of these areas to make them comparable? Okay. Yes, so your question, no, and yes. So your question is essentially about whether we have looked at the, so that analysis is all done at the level of the, um, at the level of the community. So because you can't look at the land that's entered into contracts and then compare with a counterfactual of land not entered into contracts in the treatment, in the control communities, you can't do that, you can't, because you can't identify what that land would be. So with the, with the household level analysis, we do matching to identify where, where we look at the outcomes in people that have taken up the intervention in treatment communities, and we compare that with households that have not taken up, that, sorry, that would have taken up the intervention if they'd been offered it in the control communities based on matching on all sorts of predictors of uptake. But you can't do that in the pixel-based, land-based analysis, the only analysis, the only unit at which we can really do it is the community, and that's because what would be the control for those parcels which were taken up? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So the analysis that we have done, which was that kind of like blue, yellowy, blobby thing, this is, I've got a really technical question first. Do you really want me to answer this? I will, I'll have a little very st a quick stab, um, and then hopefully we'll have some less technical ones. So essentially that analysis... We've looked at, um, we've taken account of the fact that we've looked at the proportion that was of land that was taken up in the, in the, we've looked at the, oh goodness, we've looked at the proportion of the land that was taken, there you go. So essentially, we have modeled 
the likely, at the community level, what predicts uptake of the intervention. And we've assumed that at least some of the variation in uptake isn't due to what, would, what we can model, but it's partly due to whether to, to the randomness associated with when someone turns up an intervention and says, do you want to enrol your land or not? Um, that person in some villages will have relationships. It'll be very easy to meet everybody because they'll be able to send a message in advance because they've got a brother in that community. Other communities, they can't get anyone to come to a meeting and they don't, most people in the community never even hear about the intervention. So we use that randomness. This is all a bit technical and maybe you should read the paper. But essentially, it was a really hard thing to study. But we did our best. But do read the paper and let me know if you've got a better way. Yep. Yes. Thank you. But we were definitely using a combination of quasi-experimental methods and the experiment to take account of this fact of variable uptake. That's what we were critically trying to do. So there's no kind of purity. You know, the, in, in, in RCT language, you talk about the intention to treat model, which is where you simply compare outcomes in your, tr in your treatment with outcomes in your control, and that's blind to this question of uptake. But then you use a combination of that with the more quasi-experimental matching type things to account for the fact that some people are more likely to uptake a treatment than others and take account of that, and that's what we tried to do here. But it was really difficult in the forest cover analysis because of this fact that you can't find matched sites. Yeah. I Hi, um, less technical question. Um, I'm really intrigued by that idea of like pre-registering and sticking by your hypothesis, basically. Um, but I'm wondering, do you think like the scientists need to change first and start publish like trying to publish these things more, or do the journals need to change first to accept these things more? So I think both is happening. So in some fields, so increasingly in psychology experiments, etc., you cannot. Um, publish if you haven't pre-registered, or increasingly. I mean, there's been expose after expose. There was one just the other day that looked at effect sizes in a journal before and after it introduced compulsory pre-registration of analysis. And you can see that like, um, the amount of significant findings went down massively after they introduced pre-registration. I mean, my Twitter feed is full of these kind of things because I follow lots of impact evaluation people on Twitter. So anyone who follows me constantly gets, sees these kind of analyses because I think they're fascinating. Um, so I think in some fields, it's, it's changed. I think in the fields around ecology and conservation, I think it's slower. But journals such as Conservation Biology, I'm pointing to the editor who sat there, um, <laughs> They have, you know, they're leading the way. They've introduced this idea of registered reports. So it's going beyond. They're not yet requiring that all analyses are pre-registered. I think that would maybe, you'd need to introduce something like that quite slowly. There'd need to be kind of, I think what we need to do as a community is value pre-registration more. So if you publish a negative result, if you've got a negative result, as long as it's been pre-registered, journals should be quite happy to accept that. But also I think journals like Conservation Biology introducing registered reports where the whole peer review process and deciding whether or not to publish is done based entirely on the introduction and the methods, I think is really positive. There is a second round of peer review at stage two when the methods, the analysis is done, but that they can't reject on the grounds of, oh, it's a bit of a messy story, it's a bit un ugly. They can only ground, reject on the grounds that you haven't actually followed the, the pre-registration. I mean, I've got a slide here that I think is quite, um, I've got this annoying, ba ba ba. So um, this came from a talk Jonah Bush gave, which I thought was quite nice, where he's saying, so he's the guy that had the, had the nightmare with this paper that he thought was going to be amazing um, about um, uh, malaria and then found that uh, nobody wanted to publish it because he found a negative result. And, you know, he had been so careful. The talk I saw him give three years ago when he was first getting into this was, you know, he was saying this is such a controversial topic. The literature is going back and forth, back and forth about whether there's a relationship between deforestation and malaria. So what I'm going to do is best possible approach. I'm going to make get all my data together, work out all my methods, publicly declare my methods before doing any outcome analysis at all, completely tie myself to the mast. And I saw that talk, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. What a good idea. And then I kind of followed over the next few years what happened to this paper. And I kept saying, is the paper out yet? No, it's not out yet. It's been rejected again. Oh, it's been rejected again. Literally, you know, all those rejections. And what he said in a recent talk was... Um, you know, what you've got to think about is, you know, if you didn't have a pre-analysis plan and you find no effect, then what's going to happen to that, res that result? It's just going to end up in your file drawer. No one's going to want to publish that. You know, it's not interesting. It's just a negative result. But if you had pre-registered it, perhaps, even though you find a negative result, it does get into a decent journal. And his example, you know, eventually got it into world development. Now, you don't have a pre-analysis plan, and you find a significant result. Now, his theory is, 
um, based on his own experience, I think, with this thing, is that's when you get it into a really good journal, because, of course, you know, you can really spin the story, you can tighten it up, you can drop all those messy results that actually are not so, you know, those outcomes that gave a bit of a messy result and really don't help your story. And you can tell that really tight, neat story that gets you into a top journal. Now, the question for us as a community is what happens... What is that question mark? If you've got a pre-analysis plan and you get a significant result, will we let you, you know, will we accept those papers that are going to be messier because you're going to have those other outcomes hanging around because you're not going to, in advance, you know, say I'm only going to look at one outcome necessarily. You know, you might have a kind of few things you want to look at. Are we going to put, let these papers, are we going to give them credit? Are they going to get extra credit because they were pre-registered? And I think that's the really critical question at the moment for our community, is how much are we going to value um, pre-registration? I was very similar to that one about incentivizing more of that kind of work. No, that was it. So, yeah, <laughs> how do we incentivize, incentivize people to do more of this kind of work? Yeah. And also, one more thing, actually, just a nice story, um, since you're, all, you're so interested in the pre-registration stuff. <laughs> it can be really satisfying. So, um, we, I, Hannah Wochump, the, the PhD student at Cambridge, who's doing this huge analysis with this huge, huge, huge data set. So, we decided to pre-register her analysis. Now, actually, in the end, we are not going to follow that analysis at all because, my God, it's blown up since then and got more and more complicated. But, you know, we went out there and said, this is what we're planning on doing. So, she's got her, method, her introduction written and, and what we thought were going to be her methods written. We put it out there tweeted about it, it's on bioarchive, tweeted about it. Within two days, somebody had noticed a massive flaw in her data set. So just by putting it out there, that, would have, that saved us a huge amount of embarrassment and time because rather than going through peer review and somebody then noticing, once she's kind of submitted to a journal, et cetera, she's now been able to spend four months working with the wildfowl wetland trust people to solve this fundamental problem with the data set. And it was because it was publicly out there and somebody looked at it and went, something's a bit wrong with your, where your protected areas are and how they overlap with these wetland sites. And so, you know, transparency, public, public making things public, it's, it's good for everyone. Uh, so my question is a bit about the methodologies. So with randomized, randomized control trials, what the concerns can sometimes be is that the control group receives the intervention. So, for example, say you were handing out barbed wire, how would you ensure that that didn't get into your control populations? Okay, so spillovers, yeah. yeah. And then following on from that, there's other types of randomized control trials that people use, things like stepped wedge trials, which, you know, can work against some of the criticisms of the traditional forms where you're limiting sort of interventions going to other populations. Just your thoughts on that. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Okay. So basically, any questions about randomized control trials, talk to the medics because they know way more. Um, so there you go. That's it. Talk to him. No. Okay. <laughs> spillovers. Spillovers are huge. And actually, I had a whole section on spillovers in this talk, and I've realized annoyingly I didn't keep the slides. I was going to keep the slides and have them in case someone asked that question. But I cut it from the talk because I thought it was too long and technical. So spillovers, many of us are very familiar with them in conservation. You know, there's a lot of questions. We often call it leakage when we talk about deforestation, for example. So when you... Um, red plus, big question is, you do red plus interventions, yes, it might slow deforestation, but maybe that deforestation has just been displaced outside, that's a leakage impact. Now, any randomized control trial assumes sort of unit stability, so your, if it's your, your outcomes in your treatment units do not affect outcomes in your control units. And the reality is, of course, in any kind of messy real-world intervention, that's often not the case. In an experiment, in a kind of lab medical trial, that can absolutely be fine because, you know, you give your drug to one person and you don't give it to a person in another room. How can those things spill over? But if you are, exactly as we said here, you're bringing lots of fruit trees, bee boxes and honey training into a community then, of course, that can spill over. That technical expertise, the actual materials, it could lower the price in the area of those materials that get sold off to neighbouring communities. Also, directly, the water quality could spill over. The water quality impacts could spill over because your downstream communities... This wasn't randomised on catchments. It was randomised on villages. Properly, it should have been randomised on catchments. That would have made a lot more sense from this point of spillover between control and treatment. So the point's a really, really good one. Um, how do we deal with it? So, number of different ways. So, the, um, the, the deforestation analysis, we don't think, 
is vulnerable to spillover because essentially these parcels are really quite small within the community as a whole where deforestation was prevented. We're measuring deforestation at the level of the community. If there was leakage essentially, so deforestation slowed in those parcels but increased elsewhere in the landscape, we'd expect it to be kind of what's often called on-farm leakage in the, in the pest world. So it would be within that same community. There's no reason why that would raise deforestation in neighbouring communities. So we don't think it's a problem in that case. In the water quality... Um, in the water quality one, again, it's not too much of an issue. We checked and we excluded some communities from the, uh, the water analysis because of this problem of upstream, downstream. I think there was two communities we excluded. Um, and in terms of the, um, the impacts that could be provided due to the um, impact due to the, um, you know, the actual development interventions being given, those could have spilled over, absolutely. Um, and what that would have done is, of course, mask the effect, so it would make it less likely to detect an effect. So I guess you could say that the results are at least conservative, um, but you're absolutely right. Spillover is a, another classic criticism of, of randomised control trials, and it's really hard to avoid it, and we certainly couldn't avoid it completely in our analysis. Um, the next time you do an experiment, how are you going to decide whether you need to do a randomised control trial versus qualitative analysis before you go in, when you look at the problem and make that decision? How are you going to know? Well, my, my first answer is I'm never doing a bloody randomised control <laughs> trial at the landscape scale again, that's for sure. So <laughs> that's the answer. Um, no, I'm kind of joking. Um, <laughs> kind of joking. Um, I think there's some things that experimentation really works for, and I would love to ex do experiments on. So I'm getting increasingly interested, for example, in things like the impact of nature documentaries on people's both attitude and behaviour. This is just a, you know, a side little interest of mine. I'm, I'm, giving a, I'm in, on a panel in um, Bristol tomorrow night about exactly that thing with um, nature documentary filmmakers and stuff. And I'm really interested in that. And that kind of area is absolutely ripe for randomised control trials. You know, I don't know if you know Diogo Verissimo at Oxford has done some really nice experiments, for example, where he gets people to watch the last episode of Blue Planet or and they're randomly allocated to earlier episodes of Blue Planet and watches their behaviour around what drinks they take and whether they take plastic snacks or not. Now, that's a, that's a really simple experiment to actually sort of test experimentally whether or not an inter whether or not um, this nature documentary is having an impact on people's actual choices, okay, over and over a small time scale. But I think some kind of interventions in conservation are absolutely amenable to these kind of experiments, and we should definitely be doing more of them. Um, we should think about randomization whenever we can. I mean, um, there's a wonderful book, Randomistas, the Radical Scientists who, Change, who Are Changing the World, and by Andrew Lee. And um, that book, he, he did a randomised control trial to choose the title of the book. He, he randomly, you know, it cost him 50 quid. He pushed it out on Facebook or something as a trial and used that to decide what the best cover for his book and what the best title was. You know, and he makes the point in his book, you can do experiments very cheaply on some things, and why, why don't we use it more often? Um, I don't think I could ever, I'm too old already, to engage in a, one of these big rollouts of conservation. A payment for ecosystem service is at scale. I mean, they're so painful. But I would love to do more small-scale experiments, definitely, with slightly shorter timescales. I mean, realistically, from when that RCT, the Watershed RCT, was planned and they applied for their grants to do the baseline, to when we published our last main paper on it, which is just about to come out in conservation biology, that's just over 10 years. I mean, it's a long, long process. Yeah. Okay, on that note, um, <laughs> we would I'd like to join me in thanking Julia for a fantastic talk. And